welcome back to my channel. If you are new here and like the video, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button for more content. Thank you for watching. Alright, we are back with another video and it's about time I get to this because this should have been out pretty much directly after the blind prank. Obviously, this takes place after the blind prank with the whole um, Gone Wrong with Kokogoshi uh, featuring Goshiki, I believe. It's sad that I do not remember, but we're just going to go with it. And if you do not remember, not to worry, I will be putting the link into the description. And I needed to do this before I make the fourth part of the allergy prank, which will be featuring Lev Yaku and obviously Kogogoshi. This is going to be hurt comfort, so do not worry, there is not too much angst and it will be the perfect amount of fluff. This is all going to be right before I <laughs> share my uh, not-so-fluff story that I've just been working on. So yeah, uh, enjoy this hurt comfort because it's not going to last. Kogunagawa was certainly confused to say the least. Plus, his worry for the smaller head only grew by the minute, which of course turned into a whole day. He was completely dazed from the fact he let it go as long as it did. The next day after class, he decided to completely skip practice, saying that he wasn't feeling well. Futakuchi certainly did it by it, but still couldn't help but notice the way the setter held his posture. He was antsy and ready to crumble. You know, you could have just said you had an emergency. He wasn't sure if this classified as an emergency, but all he needed was to make sure that Goshiki was okay. All day, he hadn't responded to any of his texts. Yeah, I guess so. But the way he hung up so abruptly, and his broken voice. Yeah, this actually is an emergency. He frowned, gathering his bags, leaving the worried captain behind, wondering what got the cheerful setter in such a frenzy. The raven paled, thinking about what he had done the night prior. One of their calls had never ended so quickly, so abruptly. It was all of his fault, though. He fucked it all up. Gosh, if only he had used his brain for once. He would have ignored the prank entirely and continued his conversation. He was an idiot for pointlessly wearing the taller like that. The bond they shared was forged with trust and love. However, his foolishness snapped a last remaining string. He would never stand by his side again for betraying his trust. He wouldn't blame Kokonagawa for never picking up his phone and clicking into his contact ever again. After he hung up, his chest continued to ache until his own breathing faltered entirely and faced his own dark conscience alone. He spent the rest of the night slipping in and out of his deranged state. Every time he awoke, his own fears would shake him to the core, sending him into an unavoidable attack. This might have been the first time he didn't immediately collapse into his own dwelling fear. Instead, he stared blankly at the ceiling. He didn't know what time it was, nor did he know the day, if any had passed. His phone lay shattered beside him, nearly unusable. Whenever he did attempt to look at the time, the pexy glass would impale hit the soft skin of his fingertips, leaving small traces of red. He didn't have anyone at home to check on him, given he usually leaves before everyone else so his father hadn't bothered to check on him before he left for work. He never made it to bed. He laid on the awful carpet floor that held traces of his blood dripping from the phone screen. The spiker couldn't see if he received any messages, and if he did, he certainly wouldn't have been able to process. He let out a sigh, letting his tired, deep hazel eyes relax and rested back into slumber. The blonde swung the gym doors open, the players in purple Shiro Torizawa uniforms pausing their practice. Uh, hi? He didn't realize how awkward this part would be. Well, if it isn't Daytech Setter. 
He cooed and swayed back and forth as if he were dancing to a silent song. It's Kokonagawa Kanji. What business do you have here? The captain spoke up, and he never failed to appear with an intimidating aura that made the shorter gulp. Well, I'm looking for Goshiki. Is he here? The team exchanged uncertain looks. What? Where is he? Now he was getting anxious. Well, he didn't show up to practice. Not only that, but he isn't at the dorms. The blonde froze. What was he doing here? Do any of you know where his house may be? He urged on, not wanting to give up yet. He couldn't bring himself to. Ushijima looked to the side. I'm sorry, but that is classified information that I can't just hand out. The blonde silently cursed that the captain was thinking rationally, yet relieved that he wouldn't actually freely hand out people's addresses. Please, you can trust me. That's technically what people who shouldn't be trusted would say. He laughed, hopping back and forth on his feet. No. He groaned. He wouldn't normally tell people about this, but was grasping at mere straws to gain their trust. They've only met him on the court, so they have no proof that he could be trusted. Please. Something happened last night, and I need to make sure he is okay. His voice trailed off at the end, and it was only then he realized how worried sick he was. Wait, something is wrong with him? And how can we trust you? What is this? Good cop, bad cop? His eyes widened, pulling out his phone. Look, I can prove it. We message all the time and call every night. He pulled up their call history, completely forgetting about the contact name he had Goshiki under. Ooh, Shiki? Look, Ishi, there's even a heart. The setter flamed into a bright red. He definitely forgot about that. However, it seems it is making the stone-cold captain think on it. Please. I just need to assure his safety. He sighed. Fine, but if I hear that if you lay one hand on him, I will destroy you. His voice was deep with a low growl. E yeah like on the cord. <laughs> He laughed nervously, but the iron glare he had told him that he never meant the court. He knew that he was protective with his teammates. Although he secretly knew Fatakuchi would do the same, that's if Aone hadn't already accidentally crushed their bones by innocently patting them on the back. Kokonagawa quickly wrote down the address that Ushijima graciously gave him, and before he ran out the doors, he left with some parting words. Thank you. Truly. I promise, I won't let you down. He smiled and left, leaving Shir Tozawa standing on the court speechless. Daytech Setter. How intriguing. He hummed, already bouncing around towards the ball that laid still on the ground. Do you think he'll be able to help Goshiki, or maybe even confess? Shiraba knew from the group chat just how much it hindered the spiker that he never got the courage to do anything of the sort. Only time can tell. The captain cleared his throat, taking the volleyball from his crush's hands. Alright, let's get back to practice, everyone. The setter ran, even past the point his thighs inflamed for the sudden force he put into his steps. His lungs burned upon the run. The longer he took, the more he worried for the smaller. What if something happened? Even his team didn't know where he was. What if Goshiki wasn't at his house? What if he actually went missing? He paled, not wanting to dwell on the what-ifs, knowing that would only bring out the worst in his anxiety. He took a bit longer than he would have liked getting to the front of the door of the latter's home, yet didn't hesitate knocking. 
There was no response, so he tried again before receiving the same response. Nothing. He tried rattling the doorknob, surprised to see the door unlocked, which only doubled his concerns. Pardon the intrusion. He felt like he was in the process of a robbery with a foreign house quiet like it were the home of silence. Is anyone home? He'd rather not bump into Goshiki's dad, but he was sure he could explain even though he was 100% breaking and entering. Oh, this is so going to put a mark on his record. Goshiki? He called out before realizing his error. He wasn't looking for just anyone in the Goshiki household. Sutomu? He crept up the poor excuse of a flight of stairs, given that it was only four steps onto the next level, glad his memory was proven good with their previous calls. The setter walked to the end of the hall where he believed the smeller's room was. The door was closed. Sutomu? He asked again, knocking his knuckle lightly onto the door, wanting to give him some sort of privacy, although it seemed foolish, remembering he literally walked through the front door without being invited. He silently whined, already seeing Ushijima hunting him down in the near future. Already seeing it pointless, he spoke before turning the knob. I'm coming in. He prayed that if Goshiki was in there, that he would be spared the humiliation and was decent enough. However, once the door was open, his concerns about the latter being indecent diminished into thin air. That was the least of his worries. He stood there frozen, not sure what to do. Goshiki, the one he fell in love with, was on the cold floor, motionless. The setter's dark eyes merely skimmed the traces of blood where his fingers were. He cursed. He should have gotten here sooner. He begged his legs to move. A small wine from the smeller was what broke the trance and he ran over, crouching down, pulling Goshiki into his arms. Sutomu? He sounded like a broken record, shouting his name, desperately aching for a response. As if his silent prayers were answered, the smaller's eyes squeezed tightly before he opened them, having the squint to get used to the light. Hey, look at me. Goshiki's unfocused eyes finally landed onto the taller's. Koka. His voice was raspy and almost seemed drained even though he had been sleeping for so long. Yes, it's me. What happened? Finally remembering what led to the point he was on the floor, Goshiki shook out of his hold, tears already flooding his vision. No, I'm sorry. His voice had a quiver, afraid that the only reason Kokonagawa was here was to yell at him for pranking him. Well, calm down, it's okay. You have nothing to be sorry for. But I do. The blonde silenced himself by thinning his lips into a tight line. I... I worried you for no reason. I didn't mean to, but I... Damn it! I can't even put it into words. I... Hey, Sutomu? His voice was so soft and gentle. It was the complete opposite from his loud and rowdy self. It caught the smaller off guard. He finally reconnected his gaze, meeting his kind eyes. A soft smile reassured him that everything was okay. Look at me. It's okay. You did nothing wrong. It was a harmless prank. I was more confused than anything, but it's okay. Can I touch you? He realized and cringed at how weird and perverted that sounded, but that didn't matter. Koshiki looked borderline into entering a panic attack, and he didn't want to be the cause of setting it off. He was such a strong person, so seeing him crumble like this made his chest ache. The smaller slowly nodded before crawling over to the taller, who took his spot next to him on the floor. Koganagawa flushed, finding the sight adorable, but shook it off seeing how he was comfortable enough to let him in. 
He pulled the ladder into his arm, stroking his thumb against the side of his arm, and the other hand brushed the raven's locks from his eyes. You're okay. I promise. Has that been your only worries? He found himself rocking back and forth, seeing that the smaller was finally relaxing, and laid his head against the ladder's chest. Yeah. It might seem overdramatic. But it really isn't. He quickly retorted, earning a small giggle. But it's because you're a very important person in my life. I care about you, and I thought that I had chased you away. I couldn't bear it if I did. My life, it would be so sad and lonely. He sniffled into his crush's shirt, completely unaware of what this was doing to the latter. He was beyond overjoyed with happiness. It almost brought tears to his own eyes. It would? More than you know. More than he'd like. If he didn't know any better, this almost sounded like a confession. He grabbed onto the ladder's hand hopefully, finding courage he hadn't thought possible in a million years. I do too. I care about you more than words can even describe. I've grown really attached to you throughout the time we began our calls. He smiled fondly at the memory, still rocking in place with Goshiki in his lap. The smeller just stared up at him in amazement, like he were the most precious thing he'd ever lay eyes on. But there seems to have been something that I've come to realize. A wave of uneasiness washed over him. Was he really going to do it? Goshiki sensed his discomfort and grabbed a hold of his hand. I like you. Well... I mean really love you, but those words are said too often, and I don't know how to convey my thoughts into words that mean more. He flushed, realizing what had escaped his lips. Gosh, sorry, I don't even know if you're gay, I just... He took a deep breath. I fell for you, Satomu, and you could do whatever you want with this information. You can even ask me to leave for good. He was cut off by being harshly pulled down by the smeller, by the collar of his gym uniform that he hadn't bothered changing out of. The blonde's eyes widened upon feeling the warmth of his crush's lips on his. It only took him a split second to snap from his daze in realizing that this wasn't some dream that his head would occasionally come up with and return the raw emotions through action alone. The blonde pulled the smaller by the waist, finding his free hand getting lost in the latter's raven locks. He pulled away first, with Goshiki following with, before ultimately giving up, realizing he was out of breath. The taller laughed seeing this, squeezing his hand when he saw the flaming red dusting over his cheeks. Goshiki just held onto his hand, unaware of the latter gazing at his fingers. Don't worry, it was just a small cut. Well, that isn't going to cut it. He huffed, but noticed the smaller's blank expression. Okay, there was no pun intended. That was horrid. Hey, I said that was... You know what? That doesn't matter. He got up leaving the room. The action made the smaller internally panic. His pulse thundered against his chest, and his hands regained its tremble. Had he chased him off? Was he too harsh? He didn't mean to come off like that. He just... Tsutomu? The taller made his way back to the smaller side, making a mental note to be more careful whenever Goshige was still in this fragile state. It wasn't that he was weak. He actually thought of the spiker as one of the strongest, but the mind could be the most damaging thing known to humankind. And that's exactly what the raven was facing. Hey, I'm right here. I had to get a first aid. He nodded his head in understanding taking a deep breath to calm his nerves already finding his hand back into the setters. While Kokonagawa was busy cleaning the small wounds on the tip of the latter's fingers, his eyebrow arched. Hold up, there is barely any cut. I told you it was nothing, but you didn't listen. 
The blonde laughed and shrugged, wrapping them up in the small band-aid before placing a small kiss on the covered hands. It doesn't matter. As a volleyball player and a spiker, your hands are important and vital to you. I don't want you to have to take a break for something as silly as a small cut. Because even that can hinder your movements. We can't have that. He giggled, subconsciously swinging Goshiki's hand in the air like they were singing to a tune. Goshiki was eternally grateful for the taller's love, at least that's what he thinks this is, and kindness, but something lingered on his mind. Um, so... So? He mimicked the action to push the smaller further. What does this... He pointed his fingers to their hands that still clung to each other, and his injured hand and lips that still felt the tingly warmth of his crush's lips. Mean. The taller flushed at what the latter had been implying. Well, it can mean anything you want, but personally. He leans in close, already feeling the magnetic pull his lips had on the others, wanting more. I want to be more than friends. He was sure what he wanted. Can you... Will you be my boyfriend? The words died down towards the end, to entrance into the latter's beautiful eyes, which seemed to widen and glow in between Kogane's words. He beamed, squeezing his hand and shaking his head. What do you think? The blonde laughed, pressing his hand against his lover's. Well, it's about time. I've been waiting for you. The smaller scoffed. You've been waiting? What do you think I've been doing for just as long, if not longer? Okay, so we were both idiots that kept our feelings at bay. Deal. They laughed together, letting their sorrows for moments prior melt away at the euphoria of their newfound love. Well, there you guys have it. I told you I am capable of making a fluffy ending. You guys doubt me way too much. But this adds to another couple that is officially a couple in the prank series. Let me go ahead and get my list so I can go ahead and tell you guys which ones are not a couple. Okay, so we have Kiyoyachi, Masuhana, Ukatake, um, Kokugoshi. Wait, no, Kokugoshi is now a couple. <laughs> Continuing, Kiyohaba, Kinkuni, Kagihina, Bokaaka, Asenoya, Ofuta, and Ushiten. So that is 10 ships out of the 20 that I am currently working with. So we are halfway done. Oh my gosh, that's that's almost scary. Any guys, I will go ahead and end it on this note. Because I made fluff. Get ready for some angst. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. As always, if you'd like to be kept up to date, check out any of my social medias. I hope that you all have a wonderful day or evening.